Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Sunflower Sutras. I'm your host, Tara. To kick off today's episode, I would like to start with a poem that has an interesting history. This poem is titled, Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep, written in 1932 by Mary Elizabeth Fry. Fry was inspired to write this poem by the duress of her young housemate, Margaret Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf, a Jew, was unable to visit her dying mother in Nazi Germany. The poem was never copyrighted nor published. Do not stand on my grave and weep. Do not stand on my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand on my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. And now it is a true delight for me to introduce to you, my listeners, an international poet, Mugabe Bienkia. There you go. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate y'all. Would you care to tell us a little bit about yourself? You've got a very diverse background. Yes, definitely. Uh, so I come from a very diverse and very privileged background. I was born in Nigeria to Ugandan parents because my father at the time uh, worked for the United Nations Development Program. And so um, the way that his position operated was every three or four years, they moved him to a different country and my family along with him. And so when I was three years old, we moved to Sudan. When I was six, we moved to Bangladesh. When I was nine, we moved to Cambodia. When I was 13, we moved to Thailand for a few months. And my entire upbringing up till that point had been very, very privileged because the UN like looks out for its people. And so an amazing benefits package. Uh, so the UN was paying for school. The UN was paying for flights back home every year. The UN was paying for a house. The UN was paying for a car. And so my dad didn't really have much by way of expenses because groceries don't cost that much. <laughs> and so uh, we were doing really well. And then my dad unfortunately passed away in Thailand. And so that was like a massive shift in dynamics because we went from being incredibly privileged to me sharing a bedroom with like nine other people in like, you know, not the best um, surroundings and living in Uganda, which was home, but a home that I never really lived in and a home that I mentally did not um, really fit in because I felt a lot more Asian than I did African mentally because I spent the majority of my life in Asia thus far. And I was going to school with incredibly, incredibly privileged children because my mother took out a ridiculous amount of debt and loans to be able to finance our education because she wanted us to still have the same level of like incredibly high quality education that we had. But this meant that I would go to school with kids who like would go to Paris for the weekend to buy a pair of shoes. <laughs> and then I'd come home, like work in my mother's restaurant, do my homework in the back room under candlelight, like pick up my little sister. And it was a huge, huge transition, but it taught me a lot. And so after high school, I was incredibly high academically achieving and always just put in a lot of work at home and at school. And I managed to get a full ride to go to KU. And so I ended up at the University of Kansas where I worked and put my way through school uh, along with the full ride because full ride was only uh, tuition wise. And so after that, I m moved up to Michigan for a little bit for grad school because I got a fellowship there. And that was where I suffered from two back to back strokes, which is where the book starts. And your book, Dear Philomena, mm -hmm. that is your debut book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, released February 26th of this year? 2017, actually. Ah, 2017. Yeah, mm -hmm. And you've been doing an almost nonstop book tour. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been just like the States or... It's... I know you mentioned a little bit about like Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Toronto is like one of my home bases because I have a brother who lives there. And uh, my brother doesn't have a roommate. So he was like just basically lonely <laughs> and so he hit me up and he was like hey like i was um, about to leave the states and he was like move up to toronto with me for six months uh you don't have to worry about rent and i'll feed you 
I, I just need company. And I was like, I, I could have, <laughs> that sounds like an amazing arrangement to me. So I took him up on that. And that was where I completed the book. And that was where I found my publisher. And so originally I put the book out and I was just intending to like put out a couple copies and sell to my family and friends. And that would be it. But I remember bumping into one of my friends at a jazz club in Toronto. And he said, so what's next for your tour? And I looked at him like, like, how can I go on tour? I'm nowhere near established or nearly successful enough to go on tour. And I have no idea how that would even work. But then I got like two bookings for like performances in the Toronto area, just through like open mics and things that I was doing. And that like gave me the confidence to see what it would take to get more bookings. And I started touring July of last year. And I was on tour from July up till oof, January this year and that took me uh, from originally I started off in Uganda did a couple of shows there and then throughout Canada Vancouver Regina Calgary Edmonton Toronto Halifax and then throughout the states too I did LA DC Chicago Seattle Kansas City then I went back up to Toronto took a month off for February and then started back up again March through May no Mar March through June of this year and then I went Back home to Uganda because I got booked for a literary festival there. And then did that and did a couple shows in Uganda and then got booked to go travel to Rwanda for the first time ever, which is amazing. Did a show there and then I ended up kicking back up because I got a lot more North America bookings. So now I'm touring through North America once more. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking to wrap up and finally like rest and take a break um, in January. Yeah. <laughs> that is a much deserved rest yeah. <laughs> I need it oh, that has to be amazing because I can only imagine the incredibly talented and dynamic group of people that you've probably met mm -hmm. both between how long you've been touring mm -hmm. and just all of the many 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 places that you've toured mm -hmm. most definitely yeah. it's, it's, it's been a massive blessing and I've been incredibly blessed and privileged by the people who have like opened their hearts and homes and spaces to me uh, because like I'm on a tight budget because I'm a touring artist and a lot of people have you know like opened up their homes and been like oh you can stay with me for a night or two like no worries and they're feeding me and they're helping like support me along the way because um, I wouldn't be able to do it without them like in Kansas City on Sunday I had a show there and after the show got home to my friend's place and I checked my email and somebody had sent me a hundred dollars via PayPal and they were like all I need is one book send it to this address and keep the rest for tour travel costs oh yeah <laughs> how <laughs> Which is, yeah and like the generosity of the human spirit has just like amazed and floored me during my time on tour before dear Philomena mm -hmm. you were a spoken word artist mm -hmm. and how long had you been actually doing that um so I started off doing spoken word honestly 2014 when I moved to Michigan yeah so I moved up to Michigan in 2014 and before that I had like done like the occasional open mic but um, I was very very scared of performing at the time and so I would never really like publicize it I'd just go secretly do my thing and then like walk off I'd always felt comfortable on the stage but I never felt but I felt more comfortable as a public speaker and like a speech giver than as a poet then I moved to Michigan and I was trying to make friends so I went to a poetry slam and I won and then I was like oh this is fun <laughs> like winning is fun and I also just loved the, the sense of community that they had and so I started slamming there and doing spoken word there and was good at it and I was supposed to go to nationals with the team but then I suffered from the two strokes which led to like one and a half years just out of it recovering and so I got back into poetry after I had like regained most of my mobility and stuff and when I was in a space where I was writing the book and the poetry has really offered me a lot of opportunities because I have been have been able to build a more engaging performance um, around my poetry and my prose because a lot of people who are not into literary circles and literary scenes don't really enjoy prose readings because it can get monotonous at times if you're just sitting there and listening to somebody read from a book like to a lot of people that's amazing to some people it's a tad dull and so the poetry helps keep it more engaging and helps keep it more like alive in a performance. And it also helps me get booked at both prose and poetry reading series, which keeps me on tour for longer. <laughs> so you brought up that Dear Philomena mm -hmm. was a project that really got kickstarted after your recovery period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I believe you had mentioned in a previous interview mm. that the amount of trauma mm. from that experience mm -hmm. is what really drove you to, I need to write a book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what was that like for you? Like, what was that headspace? Like, obviously, recovery mm -hmm. is an incredibly draining experience. Mm -hmm. But on top of the stress of trying to complete a mm -hmm. massive project like a book, mm -hmm. how was that for you? It was incredibly difficult and incredibly taxing because I suffered from two back-to-back -back strokes in late 2014, which led to a whole bunch of health issues. I was having multiple seizures a day, ridiculous amounts of pain from head to toe, um, chronic fatigue, migraines, and I was going from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to get my health situation figured out, and they all told me they didn't really know what was going on, but my health is getting progressively worse, which I could have told them, and that I was likely going to die by the end of the year. And so that was really what kickstarted the project, was that I was facing my impending death, and I had always wanted to be a writer. Um, I'd always wanted to like write and like work on like full-length projects. I did matterings of poetry here and there and spoken word here and there but I never pursued it as seriously as I uh, could as I wanted to because I was pushed out of it um, because it's not the most practical or sustainable career and pushed into the sciences because I was good at the sciences a lot of people were like if you're good at this thing that not a lot of people are good at why would you throw that away for writing and also just because I didn't have the time to write as much as I would like to because I was always just working and in school and just like I didn't have the large blocks of time that I wanted. But then facing my impending death, I was like, it would be terrible to die and not have at least tried. You know? yes. <laughs> no more pushing your dream to the back burner. Exactly. And I had time, like I was recovering, I wasn't doing much else. But because of my um, disabilities and complications as a result of my strokes, I physically couldn't handle much. And so that was the most difficult part of the writing process was that I would write for like 15 minutes. And that 15 minutes of writing would lead to a three hour long seizure, mm -hmm. uh, which is excruciating and had me wrestling with whether or not writing was worth it, whether or not putting my body through all of that was worth it. And like, I'm still not sure if it was, uh, but I got something out of it. Now, the name, mm -hmm. where does Dear Philomena come from? So I personally pronounce it Philomena. So I'm going to pronounce it Philomena from now that's, on. That's but, fine. <laughs> but it's one of those potato potato situations like Philomena, Philomena. It's a Francophone, Anglophone thing. So like both pronunciations are perfectly correct. But so Philomena is who I was supposed to be. Um, because when I was in my mother's womb, the doctors did an ultrasound and told her, congratulations, you're expecting a baby girl. At which point she was super excited, super happy because she had wanted one girl and sorry, two girls and two boys. And she thus far had one girl and two boys. And so she needed her second girl to round out the quartet and to like, <laughs> like satisfy her dreams. Um, and so she, now that she was expecting her second girl, she picked out the name Philomena for that baby girl. And she threw a baby shower, got a bunch of pink dresses and floral bonnets and all these hyper feminine clothing products. And then she gives birth and congratulations, the doctors say, like he's a boy so they assigned me male at birth which my mother was shocked by <laughs> so shocked in fact that she didn't even have a name for this boy that she'd had and my birth certificate literally reads baby Bianca because uh, <laughs> my mom was just like I don't like just call him baby we'll, we'll, we'll change it later like I, <laughs> I don't know what to do and for the first like year or so of my life she dressed me up in all those pink dresses and all those floral bonnets and all those hyper feminine clothing products and she really like raised me as the girl that she wanted until I outgrew them and then she was like, all right, be whatever you want to be. Uh, <laughs> and so I was raised with this narrative and raised with this story of Philomena is who you're supposed to be. That's something like my mom's like raised me with. Um, and she occasionally makes all these snide comments where she'll be like, oh, you have such beautiful eyelashes. They're wasted on a boy. <laughs> But then she had my little sister uh, six years later, and she was like, I got my second girl. I just have this bonus child. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. but, so I took that narrative that I was raised with, and I decided to craft a series of conversations between myself and Philomena. And so that's what the book is. And so it doesn't read like your typical novel because it's, a, I like to call it an epistolary experimental narrative because it's told mostly through myself talking to Philomena. It's told mostly through a dialogue. And so you get to know about what I'm dealing with uh, for that year of my life that I was supposed to die, but managed to live through. And you get to know what Philomena is dealing with. And fleshing out her character was very, very interesting in creating a fully fledged realization of what my life would have been like and how it would have been different if I was born as a woman. 
And so it incorporates uh, social media entries and YouTube videos and diary entries. And it was a very, very cathartic experience for me because it was a way to just get everything out, especially over that incredibly traumatic year. And it was a way to just like vent unapologetically and not have to hold anything back because with family and friends, I held back because I was like worried, you know, about what they'd think or what they'd say in response to some of the things that I was dealing with. And so with Philomena, I could be like unapologetically vulnerable, which was a beautiful experience. So Philomena for you is a persona, a persona for all of the things that you really needed to express Mm -hmm. and all the things that... Obviously, life had thrown you in a different direction than you know mm-hmm. than you had originally planned mm-hmm. with your health and everything. Mm-hmm. So, do you feel like this book and completing this book mm-hmm. has really helped you understand yourself better as a person? Oh, definitely, definitely. Like, like this book has helped me tremendously. It's helped me in processing a lot of like emotions and unpacking a lot of trauma. Uh, it's helped me in like embracing my femininity more strongly. It's helped me in um, realizing and expressing gratitude to my friends who like I embodied a lot of characteristics into the character of Philomena because I've I've only lived life as someone who identifies solely as a woman for like a year (laughs) Uh, when I was a baby. And so I can't like understand that experience. I had to involve some research, which was texting my friends and figuring out like um, how to fully craft a realistic woman. Yeah, it's, it's helped me tremendously. And more importantly, touring has helped me tremendously in connecting with people and bonding over like shared vulner- vulnerabilities. Cause like I'm speaking about like some of my most traumatic experiences while I'm on stage. And afterwards, I have a lot of people come up to me and tell me about things that they've never told anyone before. And just they're bonding over a shared vulnerability. And that's something that like I've turned into a personal mantra of sorts is vulnerability is strength. Um, and it's something that I try to embody through my writing and through my living practices and something that um, like spreads. Now, you said earlier that the process of writing the book has and also your health mm-hmm. has changed the way that you think about when you're performing a, a spoken word pieces. Mm-hmm. How do you go about being a spoken word artist reading from your kind of like multimedia prose? Mm. So what I do is I model my sets honestly after musicians because my brother's a musician and through him I and through just life I just and because I've always wanted to be a musician but just never like practiced Uh, (laughs) (laughs) for some reason writing is just so much easier than the dedication it takes to uh, learn an instrument but musicians like I go to a lot of concerts and a lot of like independent shows by like my friends and stuff and a lot of musicians how they like design their sets is you know they play a song and then they talk for a little bit and they like try to link the past song with the next song and then they play the next song and so I design my sets along a similar vein where I perform a poem or read a little bit of the book and then I um, go into like a banter which has evolved over time while I've been on tour from like you know, like short banter bits to like longer banter bits, which like link the proceeding with the forthcoming uh, piece and also like incorporate a lot of comedy into it. And like a lot of people say that like my sets honestly remind them of stand up quite a bit because I'm talking about incredibly depressing and incredibly dark subject matter. And so I feel like injecting the comedy into it is a like one way that I deal with things like Spider-Man taught me that. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But it's also like it helps people who walk into the show and who are like, you know, like taken to a very, very dark and low place. It helps them to interject that comedy into it and to like see me laughing about my experiences, even though they are depressing because like it's possible to be simultaneously happy and depressed. And I try to embody that. The complex, multifaceted nature of man. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. It's a bit of a superficial question, but when I looked up some of your pieces that you've performed Mm -hmm. at slams and Mm -hmm. stuff, there's music in the videos. Mm. Do you play, do you do your pieces to musical accompaniments? Oh, so I call myself an occasional rapper because I started off as a rapper, but got into spoken words because honestly... I had trouble with uh, my producer at the time. Oh. He, yeah. <laughs> the person who was making my music, he, he just didn't have the time to like um, collaborate as much as I would like to. And so I was like, I wanted to write, but I didn't have 
like somebody who's willing to write me enough music as I wanted. And so I got into spoken word because I was just like, oh, this is like a cappella rap. Like I'll have more performance opportunities and more opportunities to write pieces and not be constrained by instrumentation. And so occasionally I, I, I do perform pieces with music in the background or with like live bands because I, I guess I am a pseudo musician through that. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit of a silly question, mm-hmm. but it sounds like you get a lot of gigs mm. um, in several different cities. Definitely. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your like favorite oh, that you've had so far yeah, over yeah, the book tour? Regina, Saskatchewan is one of my favorite cities. It was a highlight because um, it's in the middle of the prairies of Canada, very similar to like a Kansas in terms of like reputation. Because a lot of people in Canada, especially in the bigger cities, see it as like a flyover state, like with nothing really there but like farms. But similar to Kansas, I fell in love with it because of the strong sense of community. Because I grew up, before moving to Kansas, I grew up in a lot of incredibly large cities. The smallest city that I was in was like three million people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And so like coming to Lawrence, Kansas for my undergrad was like a massive shift in dynamic because Lawrence is like a hundred thousand people, which is, you know, like a decent sized town. But in comparison to what I grew up with, it was tiny and there was just so much open space. And it caused me to shift a lot of my concepts of like development because like I saw so much open space and my mind immediately went like why isn't somebody bought this up and developed it you know (laughs) (laughs) and I was like oh no like this is good like there's open space and like you can actually get to know people on a deeper level and Regina I felt had a very very similar vibe and also just it was very very multicultural I walked into a bar after um, my show with uh, my hosts for the night they took me out for like a drink or two and there was some people in the corner they're like three Somali people speaking Somali. There was like a Swahili conversation. There was a Portuguese conversation. And it was amazing to be in a place that people have this reputation of, but that completely subverted that. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, the idea of thinking that Canada has its own Kansas. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) So in the future, Mm -hmm. what do you see yourself doing? I honestly, I would like to go back to school because I left my master's program um, after one semester uh, because of the strokes and I ended up uh, dropping out because I just wasn't in the right place to continue. But I would like to go back to school, but not for the environmental sciences, but for business because like I am an independent artist and I have a publisher, but we worked out a hybrid deal where I own all the rights to the book and I manage everything myself. Uh, which I did because I had seen a lot of experiences with my friends in the music industry getting massively screwed over by uh, corporations and by record labels and like signing away um, all their rights and getting like these big checks. But then the label comes back and is like, oh, we need that money back because it didn't sell the way we, we wanted it to or to pay this person or to pay this person or to pay this person. And I wanted to see what it would be like to do all this by myself, which would be cheaper because <laughs> yeah. I don't have to employ anyone, uh, but also it'd be a valuable way to build a wide variety of skills that I can use for negotiations in the future. And so one of the things that I would love to do with school and like understanding the theoretical and the practical nature of business more, especially the arts business, is I'd love to like be able to build a more sustainable model for artists to um, make art and to be compensated appropriately. Because even though I, in terms of my tour and my sales, it's comparatively incredibly low compared to authors who are like on bestseller lists and with these massive publication companies, I'm making more than they are. And that like the fact that I'm able to sustainably like fund myself through my I mean, I depend a lot on the generosity of, you know, people, but I'm able to like get by and I would love to be able to flesh that out more to help out other artists to sustainably practice their art and to not have to be starving artists. I wish you all the luck in that (laughs) because I know that myself and many other people would appreciate if you Mm -hmm. could figure out the uh, like the Rubik's Cube Mm -hmm. of (laughs) make art get money. Yes, (laughs) (laughs) It's tricky, but like art deserves money and there is a lot of money in art. But I believe that there's a more there's an issue with the equitable distribution of that money. Cause yes, the money's going to the rich high shot executives, you know, who are the top of the record labels or the publishing houses, and like the fact that publishing 
the literary industry and the music industry are like oligopolies, you know, like five companies run 90% of each industry. And that's unfair. Um, and like more attention needs to be brought to that. More attention needs to be brought to how to get investors in your product in ways that don't necessarily give up a lot of control because people like Chance the Rapper is an amazing example who is an independent artist, but at the same time has massive, massive, massive investments through Apple Music, through Spotify, through KitKat, you know, like he's, he's getting a ridiculous amount of money. And so like, it's like, how independent is he if he still has all these massive investors into his product? And how can we help people either like get to a higher level of their artistry and get the time to focus on their art that they need and not have to be slaving away and be weekend warriors and you know it's it's a struggle but the fact that there is so much money in the arts industry and that it's going to everybody on top involved in the business side of things and not to the actual people creating the art that's unfair i could not agree with you more (laughs) (laughs) this piece that i'm going to perform is called hashtag right and it is about my writing process i let my writing speak for itself incandescent auditory wealth Illumine your mind with these rhymes that I spit in time. Quantize the fine highs and lows of intonation. Up, down, left, right with this clever articulation. Mixing hues and shades. Literary matriculation. Writing can at times get so damn frustrating as I. Sit here drooling ink. Staring at these blank white sheets. Inspiration playing hide and seek. Can I get a peek at the genius foretold and foreshadowed? Labeled avant garde, but lately my mind's been fallow. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Mind cultivating like aloe. Wanna go out with a bang like on a gallow, but in order to do so, I must light. To achieve heights and get flyer than a kite? Hell no. I'd rather do things au naturel. I want to feel like braille. To gel the neural wells. To ring the upstairs bell so as not to curtail. No nails in sight as far as I can tell. All my tails huffing and puffing like a gale. Call me Miles Pryor. Treat me left and you'll be left in a situation dire. For I do not tire. Can we get much higher? Literary serotonin is flooding my brain. The bane of my existence causing me pain. No dame, no pain. The old tune wanes as I let the neural rain arraign my brain. I think I just came. Why do I let the highs and lows take over me? Compulsively obsessed with my supposed mediocrity. Why can't I just let myself be? Give myself to the creative process instead of processing creatively. What is this nonsense? On one more? (laughs) Please. All right. (laughs) So this next one um, is called uh, If I Die, Bury Me Next to My Father. If I die, bury me next to my father. If I die, bury me next to my father. If I die, bury me next to my father. If I die, bury me next to my father. One grave over from Jaja Musaja. One grave up from the one foot grave of the one month old cousin I never got to know. We're gonna need to clear some more trees around the family graveyard soon because death trails my family like the police trail me walking through my neighborhood as the on and off resident for the past two years or my brother walking through the neighborhood as a resident for the past five years as they pull up next to us roll down the windows and ask excuse me sir what are you doing in this neighborhood Have you ever felt homeless in your own home? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mugabe. It was such a pleasure to have you here. And thank you so much for taking a little 
time from your super, super busy schedule to come over to the Washburn campus and share your words with us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate y'all. This was a beautiful interview and an amazing space. Thank you for your insightful line of questioning. And now for our listener submission. This week's submission comes to us from Michelle Mickle. Living in the shadows of the Shawnee National Forest, Michelle Mickle wears many hats of her choosing. Writer, editor, educator, poetess, creatrix, metaphysical practitioner, cat herder, and human. She is a regular contributor to the Urban Howl, and her work has appeared in various publications. She can be found at either Wordison, www.wordison.com, or on Instagram at Shakti Energy. That is S H A K T I Energy. Kalima, bloodied, unbridled, bewildered. She dripped red silk, crimson paint, skull garlands, disembodied arms. Tongue lolling, eyes wild, hair snarled, she burnished her sanguine sword over the beloved corpse the carrion eater coveted. Bowing, procrastinating, groveling, they brushed the tips of her plaster toes, whispering benedictions rife with fear. Entranced, enamored, enraptured. I sat, sari-clad amidst the dusty masses on cracked, pink, sun-banked tiles. Sister, here, why? They asked, touching my alabaster skim, pulling my coiled tresses. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I answered, soul opening, offering up personal demons that she hungrily devoured. Memory Chicago, Drake Hotel, November 2005. 1. Reels of the mind flicker smoky blue, rewind, replay, repeat. She knew this movie, oh, so well, every actor, each line, entirety of the scene. 2. She saw him grab her hand tightly, too tightly, across the low table, as the laughing couple at the far end of the atrium posed for wedding photos, as the disinterested bartender polished water-spotted glasses with his starched apron, as heavy sleet pelted down on another wintry November night. She heard herself tell him that he could leave, leave her city, leave her life, leave her heart. She witnessed him lean in closely, saying he'd have her, have her hand, have her mind, have her all. She observed the sudden shift to bullet time, a film effect that happens occasionally in real life too, giving no answer, taking no breath, allowing him to slip a ring on her finger in time slice action. 3. With each successive screening, she searched, hoping to spot the smallest delight in that yes, a slight smile arising in the eyes, a tiny, indrawn breath of joy, any sign of pleasant surprise. Rather, there was always only reeling, resignation, regret. And lastly, we, the weavers. Tight rope walking through consensual reality, we forget our soul's charge, weaving together the ethereal filaments of all realms. Ignoring the bequest of our wise women lineage, we play small, choosing instead to stitch together earth plane minutia. Mourning our short-sightedness, grandmother spider, the morai, the knit beat their breasts in unison bearing witness as we squander our true power. Crying into the wind, whispers that we must strain to hear, they urge us back to our looms and our legacy, spinning the stories of the multiverse, our very birthright. Kalima can be found in the Ibis Head Review, Memory, Chicago, Drake Hotel, November 2005 can be found in Spit. And lastly, We the Weavers can be found in The Urban Howl. 
Thank you so much for submitting to us, Michelle. And thank you all for listening. If you would like to submit your pieces to the show, be interviewed, or just have book recommendations, feel free to message us at Sunflower Sutras on Facebook. Otherwise, you are welcome to email me directly at tara.bartley at yahoo.com. I want everything that you can give me. Give me your pieces that have been rejected time and time again. Give me pieces that you think would bore me to tears. I want your weirdest. I want your goofiest. I want your saddest. I want anything and everything because your story deserves to be told. Again, thank you so much for listening. Salonga and farewell.